Hello everybody, I'm Kat Armstrong and welcome to our channel, The Cheapskates Club. The voice and hand you may sometimes see over on my left is Hannah. She'll be moderating the comments tonight in the live chat. If you'd like to join the live chat, please make sure you're logged into your YouTube or Gmail account. Now I know there's already a lot of people already logged in. Now that's a YouTube thing, not a cat thing either. And if you have a question tonight, please put it in capital so it stands out. Sometimes the chat moves swiftly and we have trouble keeping up. Now, just one other little thing. There we go. Let me try this. If you do ask a question, I won't stop during the show to answer it. I'll, I'll try and answer it at the end if we've got time. If I don't have time, I'll answer it in the comment, comments underneath. So check back tomorrow. And if you haven't already please subscribe. Just click the subscribe button in the box below the video and if you'd like to be notified of new videos and lives when they're coming up, click on the bell. Now, I hope you all bear with me. <laughs> I know you all do. I'm trying something new tonight to help with my notes and keeping me on track. But you know technology and I do not get along, so it, I may give up halfway through. <laughs> You'll never know, but I will. Now, um, 7.31, so I'm trusting everybody's here. Let's get started with tonight's show because I'm saying do, don't be afraid, be prepared. And I'm saying that because did you know that in the USA, September is preparedness month? Who'd have thought there'd be officially a whole month just focused on being prepared? Now, you can tell, can't you? I was pretty excited when I heard about this because you all know that I'm a preparer. I'm not a prepper. I am a preparer. I like to plan ahead so that any surprises aren't disasters. And trust me, if a disaster is going to hit, it's going to hit this year. 2020 has been one huge worldwide disaster. I'm pretty sure most of us would agree with that. But let's bring it back a notch or two so that it relates to you and me and how disasters can affect us and how we can be prepared. There are so many disasters that can hit me and my family and you and your family. For us, the worst was sudden unemployment, you know, finding out within the space of 72 hours that we'd both lost our jobs, we had a baby on the way, our half a house was going to stay half a house. You know, the unemployment lasted for over four years. Hannah was well over three before Wayne got a full-time job again. But for so many Australians, last summer the disaster was bushfire. For so many Americans at the moment, the disaster is bushfire. Then we had the rains. Now, we love our flooding rains, but, you know, on top of the drought and then the bushfires, whilst the rains were needed and really welcome, they made a horrible situation so much worse in so many places. 2020 moves on a couple of months and we end up in the midst of a pandemic. That pandemic created a whole bunch of disasters on its own. Oh, just makes you shudder to think what we've gone through. Here in Australia, unemployment, lockdown, closed borders, limited travel, limited shopping, rationed food and medicines. Schools have been closed for just about the whole year. The list goes on. There's so many things that have happened this year. So you need to be prepared because even in Australia, an emergency or a disaster of unforeseen proportions can happen to any of us at any time. It's just one of those things. No, it can happen to me, it can happen to you. You need to be prepared for whatever the world throws at you. But how do you prepare for something that may or may not happen sometime in the future? And how do you do it without being afraid? <laughs> Easy, folks, easy. You start with one of my favourite activities and that's list making. Now, my first list is going to be a list of potential disasters you need to prepare for. Now, where I live, the chance of a cyclone is almost zero, but I have bushfires on my disaster list. I also have floods, 
earthquake, uh, unemployment, short-term illness, long-term illness on the list. And after living through the last six months, I've added rioting and looting to my list. Now, we haven't seen anything like what has been happening in the USA, but we have had so-called demonstrations turn violent. Now, locally, we've had a hoon or hoons breaking curfew and driving his, hers, its, theirs car all around the streets all night long. That's been followed by the police helicopter trying to trap them because they can't do car pursuits anymore. Friday night, Thursday night, last well, last Thursday morning, Friday morning, 3 o'clock, woke me up. The whole house was shaking from the noise of the car, the noise of the helicopters. It was awful. So those sorts of things are happening. So I've added writing to my disaster list because even in our safe middle-class suburban area, it could happen. Now I've got my disaster list of topics each disaster list has the things that could happen before and after the actual disaster. Could be blackouts, interruptions to the water supply, which happened to a lot of Melbourne a few weeks ago. It could be food and fuel shortages. It could be um, illness, um, you know, a wave of gastro or something goes through. It could be rioting in our suburb or street. It could be damaging our homes and vehicles. It could be a strike a fuel strike, a travel strike, a transport strike, all sorts of things. The next list is a list of things that we would need to do to prepare to live through each disaster. A lot of lists here, folks, but you'll get through them. For example, in the case of bushfire, we might need to evacuate. Now, we have had to evacuate in the past. To do that, we'd need bug-out bags. So bug-out bags are on my list with a sub-list of what should be in them for each family member because you have one for each family member and where the bags are stored so you can get them quickly in a crisis because whilst you might think that you will remember panic, nervousness, anxiety takes over, things go from your mind. Now, you can get pretty much everything you need for a bob, a bug-out bag from around your home. If there's something missing, you'll most likely find it at a $2 shop or a garage sale. If you're allowed to hold and visit garage sales, that would be great. Look for them there. Your bug out bags don't need to cost a small fortune to put together. You need a couple of changes of clothes, a spare pair of shoes, some basic toiletries, a list of medicines, a um, list of phone numbers in case you lose your phone, you've got a solar charger pop it in those sorts of things but your bags just need to be ready to grab and go now we're coming into summer in australia now get your bags ready if you live in a bushfire zone get your bags ready now and then it's over and done with you can relax we've used them before when we we're living in the country and we had to evacuate into town for um flooding not fires but flooding but what would you need if you had to stay at home during the crisis, if you were in, you know, stay in place? <laughs> it's probably a silly question for most Victorians because we already know what we need to be stuck at home. But what about the rest of you or, or international viewers? Water was raised over on Cheapskate's Chatter. Uh, that's our Facebook group. If you haven't joined us, we'd love to have you. Just pop onto Facebook and type in the Cheaps, Cheapskates Chatter and that will come. Because people are talking about storing water. Yes, you can store tap water for up to about six months. Just remember, there's a couple of things to remember. Use very, very clean bottles and if you can, buy new lids for them. Now, you'll find the lids um, anywhere that sells beer making or wine making supplies. They're not overly expensive about $3 a packet of 20 or thereabouts. Um, last time I bought them, I reuse the ginger beer bottles when I make ginger beer, but I always put a new cap on it, a new lid on it. So I, yeah, they cost about 20 cents each, something like that. Now, if you're storing water, if you're going to store water, try to find somewhere other than the shed or garage to do it. I have 
some in on the floor of our wardrobe there's some in the laundry cupboard we keep some in the patrol because we use bottled water when we go camping be a bit creative just remember where you've put it and store enough now the recommended is enough for three days so the suggested minimum is five liters of potable water per person per day so that just means drinking water this is enough for drinking some cooking and basic hygiene up to 10 liters per person per day to cover cleaning and a bucket bath now that's per person so for our household of five i would need to store 75 liters for a three-day emergency with a minimum of water 150 litres for three days if I was going to up it to the 10 litres per person. Now that sounds a lot, but it's not really. Unless you're using 600 ml bottles and then you're going to have rows and rows and rows of them. But you can use three litre milk bottles. You can use the three litre soft drink bottles. You can buy water bottles, water containers from camping stores and um Big W Kmart used to have them. I don't know if they still do. They're only a few, doll few dollars. So if you're storing water, think about those things. You also need to remember to um, keep it clean. So you can get water purification tablets. Have a water filter on hand helps. The other thing you want to think about is food. Now, we've covered pantry before, but I'll just touch on it again. Shelf-stable ingredients, Remember? Ingredients give you options, and if the power goes out, if you've got mostly shelf-stable food, you won't lose a lot. But also, if you do need to physically evacuate, you can take it with you. Think dehydrated foods if you're going to be on foot. Tins and jars if you're driving. Things that you can grab and go. So out of last summer's bushfire disaster, one of the most prepared families I heard of was able to leave their home 20 minutes after being told to evacuate. They were prepared. They planned. They had both vehicles full of fuel. Their camper trailer was packed with food, clothes, nappies for the baby and water. The gas bottle on the camper was full. They had their important papers and valuable items in a bag by the door, ready to grab and go. The kids' car seats were in the car. Phone chargers and spare cables were in the car. This young couple even had a set of handheld UHF radios in case their phones went out. Now, we've got a couple of sets of those. They came from JB Hi-Fi or Officeworks or somewhere like that. They're not very expensive. They're about $70 at the most. I'm thinking we only paid about $50 a set for them. They are brilliant. We use them a lot when we're four-wheel driving and camping, but they would be very handy in that sort of situation because they had two cars. So she was driving one, he was driving the other with the camper trailer. They could have been separated. They even thought of their pets. They had the pet cages for the cats by the door. They would packed pet food in the bowls in the camper. They'd run down their fridge and freezer. They were almost empty. They were really thinking ahead. They were in a bushfire zone. The fires were around them. They were planning ahead. When the evacuation order came, they put the pets in the cages and put them straight into the back of the car. Next, they emptied the fridge and the freezer into an esky that they had ready, popped that into the car. They went around the house. All the windows were shut tight. All the blinds were down and drawn, curtains closed. The bag with the valuables was put straight into the car. Then the kids were buckled into their seats. They were really prepared. The last things they did as they left their home were lock the front and back doors and they turned the power off at the meter box. Now they did that because they were worried and concerned with the high winds and whatever blowing around and stuff. They were worried about power surges that might actually cause a short if they'd left something plugged in inside. Now, remember, they'd emptied their fridge and freezer. So 
they turned the power off and they're worried about a short that might cause a fire in the house. So they turned the power off. Sounds reasonable to me. Within 20 minutes of getting that phone call, they were out of their driveway on the way to safety. When they arrived, they were self-sufficient. They had a home with their camper trailer. They had food. They had water. They could even care for their babies and their pets. They didn't need to rely on anyone else to do that. That family was prepared. I was I was reading it and my mind was just boggling at how prepared. Now, they spent three days getting to that stage so they could just leave, but it was well worth it for them. And thankfully, their home was saved. The fire went around them, burnt all around them, but their home was saved. Now, I'm not suggesting for one minute that you go to these extremes, although if you live in a bushfire or cyclone zones, having an evacuation plan and practising it, especially if you have children, isn't a bad idea. It pays to be prepared. It takes the stress out of a stressful situation. Another area where we need to be prepared is money. <sighs> can be a can of worms and I'm sorry but please believe me when I say you need a cash reserve in the bank if you don't have any savings start saving now if that means you have to give up something then do it it isn't forever it's only for a short time and it will and could or will save you in a crisis when I talk about emergency funds, I speak about starting with one pay period, then building to three months, then up to six months with the ultimate now, ultimately at least 12 months of all your living expenses. That's all your living expenses saved just for emergencies. This is your emergency fund. Right now, unemployment in Australia is rising. And in Victoria, it's expected to beat the national average. Yes, we live in a country with an amazing social security system. We have unemployment benefits. We have pensions. We have JobKeeper for the moment. But honestly, folks, we should not be relying on it. We need to be self-reliant and self sufficient as much as possible and that includes financially it doesn't mean thinking oh well I can always go on the dole or I can always no that's your last backup you need to be self-reliant self-sufficient as much as possible I know saving cash can be hard I've had to do it that first thousand dollars feels like you're never going to get there after that, it seems to fly to 5000 And once you've done that, it's become a habit and you don't even think about it. You just keep saving. Look, if you've got a low income, you're paying a mortgage, you've got small children, it's going to be hard. It's not easy, but it is simple. You just start doing it. It might be a dollar a week, a dollar a day, $5 a week. Cut out anything that isn't absolutely necessary to ma maintain life until you have your emergency fund built to whatever level you think works best for you. Trust me, I've done it. I know how hard it is. I know how exciting it is when you reach those goals. But we've worked and saved and scrimped and put away and gone without to build up our emergency fund. And we've actually had to use it a couple of times over the years to live. That's what it was for. And then we've had to rebuild it because that's what you do. Because at least while we were working on other things, we didn't have to worry about food. We didn't have to worry about housing. We didn't have to worry about paying the bills. We didn't even have to worry about the birthdays or Christmas because it was covered in our emergency fund budget. I'm suggesting that it is much better and far less stressful to do a little preparation now so that if you do face a disaster, you can without the stress, without being worried about how you're going to live day to day. You don't need that. 
you need those things taken away so you can concentrate on coping with the disaster. If you're feeling anxious or stressed or worried, take a little bit of time, take a half an hour to make a plan for dealing with disasters. Use my list if you like, that's fine. Once you have a plan, trust me when I say the stress eases, the anxiety will ease. You'll have a goal, you'll know, you'll know what to do. And as you become better prepared, because remember, it's going to take time unless you win a lotto. Um, and good luck to you if you do. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of money. You need to do And not many people can do it all at once. But if you do it, you know, you can release that anxiety and focus on other things. And that makes coping with a disaster of any kind, whether it be unemployment, illness, a pandemic, a cyclone, a fire, um, a rabid dog attacking, I don't know, the zombie apocalypse. I'll mention that again. I don't know. But it will make life easier for you. You won't be as concerned. You've, you've put a plan in place and saved a little bit of anxiety and a little bit of stress. We have any questions, Han? Yes, Annette, do you have a separate bank account for your emergency fund? Yes, Annette, we do have a separate bank account for our emergency fund because otherwise it will get gobbled up with the day-to-day -day bills and what have you of living. So we do have a separate bank account. If you're just starting out with your emergency fund, I would suggest, and this is how we did it, open a separate bank account. Now, we've got bank accounts all over the place at the moment for various reasons, but open a separate bank account. I actually call it emergency fund. The lady, I can remember when I first opened it years ago, the lady at the bank just looked at me like I was a bit of a nut job, but she might have been right. Hannah's nodding her head over here. Have that. Now, first thing happens is the money that we decided to allocate to that was straight away moved automatically every payday into that account. Now, we didn't have a card hooked up to it and it's still a cardless account. We need to transfer that money into another account if we need it, which we can do. So do that. Now, to make that easier for you, if you're working on the 10 10 80 plan, remember we like the 10 10 80 plan because we save 10%, give 10%, live off 80%. That 10% savings is automatically done for you. If you can afford to do that, it will build up really, really quickly to whatever level you decide is best for you. So do it that way. We do have a separate bank account. And it's a cardless account, so we have to transfer the money to be able to get it. Yeah, um, Joy, with the water filters, do you mean the Britax jug? Brita filters or we've got a Brita jug. Um, I don't use it so much here because the water here is really good. But in the case of storing water or like we had with um, – a couple of weeks ago with having to boil the water and whatever, having a water filter system is really handy. Ideally, in our dream home, we'll actually have one built into the tap, to the cold water tap in the kitchen. So it'll just be done automatically, but then we'll probably be living on rainwater anyway. So, But if you can get all sorts of things to clean your water, look, you can even clean it with... Um, a little drop of bleach. You can get water purification tablets. And when I say a little drop of bleach, I mean a little drop of bleach. Water purification tablets. You can boil it if you need to, and it needs to be 10 minutes at a rolling boil. Don't just bring it to the boil and turn it off. Give it a good 10 minutes at a rolling boil. Do you know what a rolling boil is, everyone? It's when you see the bubbles on the top and they're all popping everywhere. Do that. But the Brita jugs are really, really good. They filter out around 99% of most um, bacteria 
and germs. They're really good. I'm not sure if you want one that filters out fluoride. I don't think the Brita ones do. That's entirely up to you, though. But, yeah, Brita. And they're often on sale, often on sale. So, and the jugs are handy because they just fit in the fridge. Um, when we were in Wagga we were on ball water, I had a Brita jug. I had two Brita jugs, one on the go, one filtered and one filtering while we were using them. Yeah. So, okay. Um, okay. She's lost it. See, they go so quickly. Okay. My last delight, what happens if the banks crash? Okay. Now. In the savings at all. Okay. Now, I just mentioned in answer to Annette's question, we have a few bank accounts spread all over the place, some with banks, some with credit unions, for that very reason. Now, in Australia, we do have a guarantee on savings up to... So I said it was 200000 200, per person. Per person. And that is not per account but per person. So spread across all your accounts, you can have up to 200, you're guaranteed 200,000, protect 200,000. <sighs> Look, there is a very real chance that banks could crash. Now, we saw it in 2007, 2008 in America. It didn't happen here, but it did happen in the USA and it did happen in, in Britain. Banks could crash. We've seen it over the years with one or two odd credit unions and little independents have, have gone belly up, but we've not had a major bank crash like that in Australia for a very, very long time. But it could happen. It could well happen. And if you are following um, currency, it, it's really interesting to watch how it's going up and it goes right up and gold went right up. I think gold plunged. I was sitting, um, I think I might have mentioned this a few videos ago, sitting in the doctor's waiting to see the doctor and there was a young man a few seats over because we were social distancing and he was on his phone talking about gold. And then when I got home, I had a, an email from um, a cousin saying, you know, if you want to buy gold, now is the time to do it. Well, the next day, gold dropped. It crashed. So nothing is safe anymore. Don't, my best advice would be don't put all your bags eat, don't put all your bags in one basket. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Spread them around, and that's what we have done. We have spread them around different different banks and different accounts. You can try you can try taking cash out. I still firmly believe that cash is king, and if the banks do crash, then cash will be king again. But there's, there's a risk to having a lot of cash in your home. Even if you've got a safe, there's a risk to having a lot of cash in your home. And, of course, while you have that cash in your home, the potential for earning anything with it isn't there either. That's in, it's entirely up to you. We have a small, smallish, I keep about $1,000 of cash on hand. That's about it. Um, we haven't touched it for a very long time. Because nowhere takes cash. Because because nowhere takes cash at the moment. Well, that's pretty much true. But you know, it it was just there. I remember. I remember Y two K came to the thirty first of December nineteen ninety nine, and I went, said to Wayne, "You know what? Let's just go and get a little bit of money out, just in case." And we took. I think it was there. We took a thousand dollars out of the bank then and put it away and it just stayed for years and years and years until we decided to use it for something else. So a little bit of cash on hand is fine. I'm not a fan of huge amounts of cash in the house, but it again it's entirely up to you. You know your neighborhood, you know where you live, you know your family, your friends, you know the risks. So it's entirely up to you. But yeah, don't put all your savings in one bank account or in one bank, spread them around. It, it might be painful, um, but even just your emergency fund at a separate bank and just link, link the accounts so that you can do a quick transfer. Okay. 
I hope that answered your question. I have my tea mm. before it goes cold. Mm. 301 Jewel said she liked the emergency fun thingy in the planner. The oh, countdown thing. Hannah likes that too. She, yeah. she faithfully every week crosses it out and shows me. She comes out and shows me. Mm. We've been trying to decide, guys, about the planners because we hadn't fully intended to do a 2021 planner and then 2020 sort of went pear-shaped and um, getting getting to our printer and getting stuff from the printer will be an issue. But then we were thinking perhaps we could do a digital one where you just um, print the pages that you need if that would work, I, if, that, if you think that would work, that would be really good to let us know. We, a di we can do a digital version. Um, and then, you know, if you don't use the menu planning section, then don't print it. If you don't use the emergency fund tracker, don't print it. So that might be, um, might be an option for you. But we're really not sure. We're still up in the air about how to go with it. So we had fully intended to do one. And as I said, it just went pear-shaped. Okay, where are we up to? Um, Kerry says, I'm restarting my money bottle. Had to rate it over the last eight weeks. <laughs> okay. Is that the $5 note money bottle, Kerry, like Hannah has, or the $2 coin one? There's a few going around, isn't there? Hannah, we were talking about this. Hannah and I were talking about this last night or the night before um, because her money box, her money tin that she puts all her change into isn't getting any heavier because of, apart from the fact that she hasn't left the house for 12 weeks. Something like that. 12 weeks. Um, she hasn't been using cash so she doesn't have any coins to put in the tin. It was interesting. I um, heard on the news, uh, Channel 7 News this, this evening, that people are saving so much money with, with you know, lockdown and the crisis. Yeah. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe there's some areas you can save. Some things have cost a bit more. Some people have um, spent more than they should have because online shopping is really tempting and easier. Mm -hmm. Tell me about it. Mm -hmm. Well, even I've decided I like online shopping. I might never go to a department store again. And click and collect. <laughs> I love click and collect, folks. <laughs> Do you know Kmart does click and collect? I hope they keep it up. Anyway, so, yeah. There's not much cash around, so the cash savings is going to be interesting to see. Now, Kerry, I think you're out of lockdown. Now you're out of restrictions too, so that'll be really nice. Um, uh, Kerry, has anyone preserved eggs by rubbing olive oil over the shells? Not olive oil. Um, oh, what's it called? I don't know. Um, it's up near the top, I think. Um, oh, I've forgotten what it is. I actually have a video planned on different ways to preserve eggs because remember a few weeks ago we were talking about the avian flu. Well, it's reared its head again. There was, um, I watched a land, another landline thing on Sunday and well, if you want fresh turkey for Christmas, yeah, it's not going to happen, folks, I don't think, not in Victoria anyway. Um, in the last month, four, 450,000 birds have been euthanised because of this avian flu that's hit Victoria. I can't, I can't imagine that many chickens and turkeys. It's just, it just about boggled my mind. But then... It's also affected the egg farms. So eggs could well end up, start, you know, go back to being in short supply like they were back in um, March and April when everyone was panic buying. 
So I've been thinking, I thought, oh, well, I might look at ways to preserve eggs because you can freeze them. If you crack them into an ice cube tray and freeze them, you can do it that way. You can dehydrate them. I haven't tried that yet. Um, you can pickle them. Not a fan of pickled eggs. Hannah, sorry, got the hiccups. Hannah's eyes just nearly fell out of her head when I said pickle eggs. You can pickle them. Um, you can um, treat them with, um, you can water glass them. That's another way to preserve them. I haven't tried because I've never really had to. So eggs have always been readily available. We go through an awful lot of eggs in our house. So if we could preserve them and still have them usable, that would be good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. What else have you got for me, Floss? Um, Keep going. She's lost the questions. Um, Vicky wants to know, is the money bottle so you can't use it? Is the money bottle so you can't use it? Well, it's just a nifty money box sort of thing. Yeah, I guess you screw, you roll your notes up, put them in or pop, drop your coins in and they're not easy to get out. If you want one out, you can't get one out. You have to open the whole thing. It's like a money box. You've got to open the whole thing to get it all out. I just yeah. did it so I didn't have to buy a money box. I'll see. And Hannah said she just used the soft drink bottle so she didn't have to buy a money box. There you go. Recycling and repurposing at its best, mm -hmm. I suppose. Okay, any more? Uh, Judy Banks just said that you use mineral oil to preserve eggs. Thank you, Judy. Yes. Um, yeah. Pickle them, add beetroot mm -hmm. juice. And, yeah, I've seen the pink ones, mm -hmm. um, Kathy. I'm not a fan of pickled eggs. I love pickled onions and I love pickles, but pickled eggs don't appeal to me. That's just not right. Yes, Vicky, um, avian flu is the bird flu. Yes. So, um, now, yeah, avian flu is a bird flu. Now, I posted some links in one of the shows a few weeks ago, back in August, one of the August shows, with some links to some information about it. But if you go to the Landline website, you can view them. I'll view it on iView. I think it was last Sunday's. It has quite a bit about it. Um, yeah, water glassing, Joy. Have you tried it? I haven't tried it. I keep reading up on it and thinking I'd really like to do that. I'm a little bit nervous. It just seems, hmm, I don't know. It's a bit like the people that bury carrots in sand and leave them for years and then eat them. It just seems wrong. Um, so, all right, now what else are we up to? Okay, so don't stress. Don't be anxious and don't worry. Just make your list, put a plan in place, work your plan. It's not like we're going to wake up tomorrow and the house will be flooded. Or well, I hope we don't wake up tomorrow and the house is flooded. We don't have any cyclones heading our way at the moment in Australia. We don't, although it's pretty wet up north. I was watching that band of rain and storms come all the way across from Darwin down to Brisbane. It was huge. Um, we don't have any too, too many natural disasters going on here in Australia at the moment, I really feel, I really feel for, you know, I have friends and family in the USA and I'm feeling one side's being burnt to a crisp and the other side is being flooded and blown away by the cyclones. Hurricanes, get it right, Kat, someone will complain. Hurricanes and I just like, oh, I don't know, it's just, my heart just breaks for them. I don't know, I just. I don't know how I could, I don't think I could live through that. Now, veggie in moss. Ooh. 
Moss. I haven't tried moss. I don't know where I get that much moss in Australia. Ooh. So, ladies, gentlemen, um, Joy's um, had veggies that have been stored in moss when she visits an art in Aberdeen. You'll see Scots, they'll keep anything for any time. Nothing ever gets wasted if you're a Scot. Uh, just, uh, I can't, uh, hang on. Sorry, guys. Um, just check the site, Kath says use mineral oil to preserve eggs. Yep. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I knew it wasn't olive oil um, for preserving eggs. But water glassing, I've been interested in trying. Maybe that will be one of the methods I try. So, uh -huh. right now, Maureen. Yes, Maureen, you can freeze eggs. Now, two ways to do it. You can do them as a whole egg or you can do them as whites and yolks. If you're going to do it as a whole egg, just crack them into ice cube trays or whatever. Two eggs will fit into one of, who has the Tupperware icy pole um, things, you know, the ones that are U-shaped with this. If you use those, two eggs will fit in one of those and just put the lid on, stand them up and freeze. They will hold two eggs. You can just, uh, and then they'll pop out once they're frozen, give them a squeeze, they'll pop out to go into bags to be stored in, fro in the freezer. Or you can freeze them in ice cube trays. If you're going to separate them and freeze yolks and whites separately, whites are fine, just put them in as they are. Um, to freeze the yolks separately, though, just give them a break them up a bit with a fork before you pour them into the ice cube tray or whatever you're freezing them in. They freeze better that way. Yeah. Water glassing is when you use. Oh, Vicky, I'll have to. I can't remember off the top of my head what it's called. I've gone blank on it. It's pretty much when you preserve eggs in the shell and they're in a liquid, submerged in a liquid, and they will keep like that for up to 12 months So and still be good. Now, you, if you just get the egg out of the um, jar and crack it into a bowl, it will smell like a regular egg, taste, look like a regular egg, taste like a regular egg. It will cook up like a regular egg so you can fry it or poach it or add it to a cake or whatever. But if you compare it to a fresh egg, you'll be able to see that it is a little bit older because you know how on older eggs the yolk is a little bit darker and a little bit thicker? You'll notice the difference between a preserved egg and a fresh egg. But they do work exactly the same way. Um, Tanya, I wondered about beeswax myself. I haven't been able to find anything on that. Um, you need something that will, um, because the eggshell is porous, so you need something that's going to keep the air out. So I would have thought that wax would have worked um, a reasonable layer over it, but I don't know. Uh, yeah. Um. Vicky, they will eventually go off like all things do. Now, preserved eggs, um, it, especially water glassing, is not a forever food, but they're good for about 12 months. After that, you look, you'll know if an egg is off. As soon as you crack it, you will know if the egg is off. So, yeah. In the freezer, Maureen, three to six months if you just leave them in the ice cream trays and then put them in a Ziploc bag. If you freeze them and then put them into bags and vacuum seal them, they'll keep for about 12 months. Yeah. So if you've got a lot of eggs, freezing is a good way, and a freezer in, it's a good way to preserve them and help them last longer. And... They thaw out okay. The only time I had trouble was when I was trying to do meringue, but you know what? Didn't matter anyway. 
So, but they scramble, they fry, they poach, they go into baking just fine. And often when I've had an excess of eggs and I've been freezing them, I do separate them out because if I've got a lot of lemon juice, I make lemon butter and I use the yolks and then I can keep the whites to do the meringue for the pie. Now, frozen egg white, like I said, not so good for meringue, but it's it still holds. It's just not quite as fluffy as it would normally be. Oh, 10, 8 to 10 per day from your chooks. Wow. So sell them. <laughs> Do you know someone that will buy fresh eggs? That would be a really good way to raise some money for your money box. Sell them. Yeah. All right. <coughs> um, Kerry, I don't know about rice brand oil for preserving eggs. I really don't. Um, yeah. Do your research. Let's see. It's happened. Now, ladies, an update on the, um, speaking of preserving, an update of, on the ball preserving jars. <coughs> I was actually spoke to Kate from Oz Farmer today uh, because I was trying to order more jars and lids. The lids will no longer be available anywhere in the packs of 12. We used to get the little square box pack of 12. They will now be 24s, boxes of 24, Ooh. if you can get them. The rings will, or you can get a box of lids and rings, 12 lids and 12 rings. But the bad news is ball jars, there's not expected to get any new orders of ball jars for around 12 months. So look after your jars because you won't be able to replace them with new jars easily. So Spotlight eventually, Kerry, Spotlight eventually, I think 11 days, it took them to cancel my order too. Really annoying. So, yeah. Um, so no ball jars. You can still get WEC jars, W-E-K. They're a little bit different. They work a similar way to the old Fowler's Vicola where you've got the jar, you put a rubber ring on, you put the lid on and you've got clips for the side, but the, the lid is actually glass instead of being metal like the Fowler's lid and the clips are metal to go on. Um, there are, of course, you can do your Fowler's jars if you can get them because seriously nothing beats a Fowler's Vicola jar. They are the best preserving jars um lots of different brands some of them are cheaper some of them are more expensive so you'll have to hunt hunt around and see what you can get but yeah they're not there's no more ball jars expected to land in australia for around 12 months um Yeah, Joy, I love Fowler's. That's the, the glass in a Fowler's jar, especially if you can get the older ones, is so heavy and good because they will go into your freezer, they will go into your water bath. They are great. And, yeah, jar sealers, that's the vacuum sealer. The attachment for the vacuum sealers are very hard to get, but they're always hard to get. They have been for... Uh, years probably because it's not such a um preserving in jars isn't a typically australian way to preserve in terms of vacuum sealing and water bath canning war, um, pressure canning that's still fairly new in australia we're used to the old water bath with the fowler's jars but that was about the limit of it then we got the sunbeam food saver that revolutionised my life. I love my food saver, folks. I uploaded a video this afternoon, I think, on um, vacuum sealing chicken fillets and how I do it because I was playing with the editing and I figured out how to do it. So I thought I'll upload that. So I did. Um, yeah, so report on current affairs tonight. Expect power shortages this summer. Yeah, Kerry, see, I've been talking about this for a long time. 
all these things we've been talking about for months are just starting to hit mainstream news. Now I'm thinking it's because our... They're watching your videos. <laughs> no, I don't think they're watching the videos. I think it's because they're trying to get away from being accused of being... Um, Fear-mongering. Fear-mongering with the COVID is what I think. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yes, so, look, but last summer we were supposed to have brownouts all summer long and we didn't. We didn't have any here at all. But in saying that, we had a very cool summer for Melbourne anyway. Last couple of summers have been. We Wayne splurged and actually put the air conditioner, refrigerated air conditioning in for me and we used it twice. It was such a letdown. I was so excited to finally get air conditioning and we used it twice. It was a very cool summer last summer. I'm sort of thinking this, this coming summer might be a bit hotter. I'm hoping not as hot as it was. Remember that summer we had where we went for the 13 days of 45 and 46 degrees? That was a killer. But, you know, for Melbourne, um, I'm sort of hoping that this summer won't be quite so hot, but I think it will be a warm one. Um, yep, pumping up the pressure canning. It's why I'm moving away from the freezer and trying to get more shelf-stable foods so that if the power does go out... You know, we've got four freezers. That's a lot of food that I would be really upset to barbecue. lose. It would be a big barbecue. We could feed two neighbourhoods. Um, I would be very upset to lose that, not because we wouldn't get it back on insurance, because we would, but the time and the effort that's gone into preparing it getting it ready to put into the freezer because some of it's raw meat, some of it's cooked meals, some of it's fruits, um, baking, there's also vegetables, there's all sorts of things in there. I would be really upset. So that's why I've been moving for the last six months, no, more, 12 months, eight, where are we, September, nine months, I've been doing more dehydrating and more canning, pressure canning and bottling to get things shelf stable. Now, on that note, Back before when I was talking about, um, you know, being prepared and having a supply of shelf-stable ingredients and mentioned tinned things, if you can keep a few tins of carrots, a few tins of peas, a few tins of corn, those sorts of vegetables on hand, they don't go astray if the power goes out and the freezer's not working or if you do need to um, bug out, you've got those. But you can also get your dried veggies too. If you can't dehydrate them yourself, you can get buy dried veggies. And they're rather inexpensive um, compared to fresh. So think about adding just those few things to your food storage for emergencies. Hello, Delaney. Um, Yeah, Joy, I'm thinking, are you talking about the power thing sense, being sensationalist? There's sort of a bit of sensationalism to it, but it's mm, a bit backed up in fact in that we um, are down a couple of power stations. We're down um, a little bit on our ability to produce power, but by the same token, the power we have been sending to South Australia, we won't be sending anymore. So we should have that back in our own personal grid to use here in Victoria. I think that's what should happen. Um, um, the Grand Solar minimum, minimum, yes, there's quite a bit on YouTube about that. It's a really interesting um, interesting to listen to. Um, 
Ah, yeah, the news. Joy, the news is always sensationalist. When was the last time you actually got news? It's gossip, it's sensationalism, it's um, fodder for nothing. There's very little actual real news on the news. That's why we cut back. We don't watch it anymore. We watch one news bullet in a day because it was just ridiculous. Um, oh, yes, please, Serenity TV, 30-plus ways of preserving eggs. That would be great. Um, yeah, I'm not a fan of the Epoch Times either. Estelle, it can be its own sort of sensationalist um, and do its own sort of... It has its own um, agenda. So... If you're going to watch news, you're going to read the news, you're going to watch YouTube shows, including mine, do your own research too. Don't take what anyone tells you as, as absolute truth. I won't lie to you, but you still need to know for yourself. You need to understand it for yourself, whatever it is. So do your own research. Now, in 2020, it has never been easier at any time throughout history to educate yourself and to do it cheaply. So instead of watching reality TV shows, do your research and educate yourself on these things that are happening so that you know the facts, get the facts, cut the garbage, cut all the filler, cut all the propaganda, just get the facts so that you can be confident in the decisions that you make for you and your family. And if you can be confident that you are right, then the stress and the anxiety has gone. Okay. Um, now, I, um, I'll i throw one out here to you. I, <laughs> I watch this. I do watch this. I have for a while. Um, sometimes I roll my eyes, sometimes I bite my tongue. A couple of times I have actually left a comment, <laughs> but I quite like, because it gives me a good entryway into a good opening to do further research on topics, is Ice Age Farmer. Very, um, very dramatic, very dramatic and very, if you are, uh, halfway inclined to be if you're at all gullible you'll get sucked right in some of this some of it is really good and if you can do your own do your own research now he will have snips and uh, snippets of different stories find the whole story read the whole story not just the snippets that he puts up and do that with all your um all your research Find the whole story so you know that all the facts, get it in context so that you know, really know, and you can be confident in your decision-making. Um, yeah. Okay. Hello, Kelly. Welcome. Okay. Police presence at farmers' market. Okay, yes. Now, we had a, farm, a farmer's market here in Melbourne, and I'm in Melbourne at the moment, in, in Richmond, which is a suburb, and it was a farmer's market on a Saturday. Now, this was early in our stage four lockdown. The market was on. The rule was, um, the rule is at the moment in stage four lockdown, one person per household can leave the house for one hour per day for shopping. When we leave our homes, we must wear a mask, a face mask, and we must observe social distancing. So as part of the, um, walking the beat, so to speak, patrolling. The police did patrol one market on one Saturday morning for about 15 minutes 
just to, because this was very early on, just to remind people to social distance, wear their masks. We're also on a five-kilometre um, radius limit of where we can travel. So we've got travel restrictions. So I can't move more than, I can't travel more than five kilometres from my home. So they were also making sure that people were abiding by that. People, people haven't been. They haven't been wearing masks. They haven't been observing social distancing and they haven't been sticking to the five-kilometre limit. That's their issue. So it, it wasn't that dramatic. It was a big beat up for that. Rice shortage, yes, we do have a rice shortage. We will now... The news last week was we'll be right, we'll be running out of rice by Christmas. I don't think, and here's me who a couple of weeks ago was telling people about this. I don't think we will run out of rice by Christmas, but we do have a rice shortage. Our rice harvest has been shrinking for the last five years. For six, nearly seven years, we have been in drought where we grow rice through the Riverina, where we grow rice, has been in a dreadful drought for, you know, coming up seven years. So the rice harvest has been shrinking for six years now, coming up six years, because the water, this rice also comes from irrigation, water irrigation. The allocations have been cut because the water is not available. So the rice harvest is shrinking. Now, we don't grow in Australia, we don't grow anywhere near the quantity of rice that we as a nation consume most of our rice is imported from malaysia the problem is malaysia at the moment is in a severe drought go figure and they are having trouble supplying their own needs let alone supplying their export needs so our prime minister did approach vietnam to see if we could import some rice from vietnam and it made world headlines with we're going to be out of rice by Christmas. Rice is in short supply and it has doubled, more than doubled in price in the last couple of years. So that sort of part of it is partly true, but a lot of it is, um, is a really, it's sensationalism. It, it's a headline to grab people's interest, to get them in to read whatever else it is. So like I was saying, take it with a grain of salt. You know, we had, um, we see, we saw the riots in um, Portland, Portland and they looked atrocious. But when I did some, de some more digging and more digging and more digging, Yes, they were atrocious and they were dreadful and they were violent and horrible, not quite as bad as the actual story I'd initially seen made them out to be. Not saying they are good because I don't think for one minute they are, but it's, you've got to really, you can't take anything at face value, especially if it comes from mainstream media. Mainstream media. You can't take anything at face value. But thank you for asking and welcome to our channel. Um, and thank you for your prayers. Much appreciated. Really much appreciated. Um, oh, good. Uh, always up to learn more about dehydrating too, um, Suzanne. Um, if you're an essential worker, you still need your permits and your letters to be able to travel. But, yes, you can sort of travel almost freely. Um, okay. Hello. Hi. 16 rubies. That's Roseanne. Glad you could join us. Hannah's giving me the wind up here. Um, so let's eat pasta or potatoes. Well, I've got plenty of pasta and the potatoes are growing great guns, Joy. Oh, my gosh. Mm. Wayne, Wayne, mm, potato. Wayne even came in the other store. The potatoes are looking good. Yes. So I've got um, six bags with about eight. Six bags? Five bags. Five bags with about eight 
um, starts in each one. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, night, Lorraine. Um, so on that note, folks, NQR, if you are able to get to an NQR, has Barilla Pasta for a dollar per 500 gram bag this week. And they have the 500 gram tins of Nescafe 43 beans for $14, which isn't too bad. Or the um, new Extra Strong in the black tin, which is only a 400 gram tin for $14. So they are quite good prices for if you like um, Barilla Pasta. That's an excellent price for Barilla Pasta. That's a that's an Aldi price. So yeah. All right. Reject shop in New South Wales. Okay. Can't get to a reject shop, so I don't know what they've got. Sorry, Veronica. Um, all right. Now, I missed something up here. Needy Homesteader. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, uh, again, Kerry, the process at Queen Victoria Market was such a beat up. The camera angles were amazing to make it look up. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Anyway. Okay. Joy says, Harris, real coffee, $10. Yes. What bags? Potatoes in cat. Um, green bags. Green bags. Lisa, just, you know, the green Aldi bags that I keep talking about, you know, um, the reusable ones, like the fabric ones. No, aren't they like the plastic striped red and blue bags? Like those big oh, ones? Oh, yeah, the potato bags are. Sorry, scrap that. The potato bags are um, green but... Remember the $2 shop red, white, and blue stripy bags, that sort of fabric material, plasticky, plasticky stuff? The weird stuff. Um, they're made out of that. Got holes punched around the sides and along the base for drainage. And I just um, I put about, oh, about uh, four inches of compost in the bottom, pop my potatoes on top. Just cover them a little bit. When you grow potatoes, you just barely cover them, and as they peep through, just keep covering them. So I only covered them with soil till it's about four inches deep. Then I use straw so that they'll grow up because they'll grow through it, and the potatoes will be clean. I won't have to wash them and dig them because they'll come out of the dirt. And I just keep, as soon as it pops up, I put another little layer on and pop up another little layer until they just grow. And then... When they start to die down, you'll be able to tell your sprouts will start to die down, then they're ready to harvest. Just up in the bag, scoop up, scoop out the potatoes, put the rest in the compost pile, dig it all through. Yeah. Old tyres, yeah. Um, I'd still use old tyres, Joy, but every time I suggest using old tyres, I get held down because of the rubber and the something and the something and the something. So I don't suggest old tyres anymore. The bags are really good because I can move them around if I need to. Um, yeah. Save more. Yes, save more is um, excellent. It has great butter and stuff. I keep saying. Sorry, she's she's trying to hurry me on, but anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, Vicky, I do water them um, if they need it, but mostly they're out. We've had so much rain in the last couple of weeks. We've gone back to winter now that I don't worry about watering them too much. Um, stocking different varieties, potatoes from fresh to dried, mashed potatoes, dehydrated, hash browns, potatoes. Perfect. Canned potatoes. Yep, we like tiny taters in the cans. Great for camping. Um, two 10-pound bags of beets for preserving on Wednesday. Wow, that's a great price, Jamie. Perfect. $5 bag. Yeah. Okay. You can... Yes, 16 rubies. You could just slice off those eyes and let them dry a bit and then punk them in the ground and they grow. It's really good. 
Um, Lisa, Save More is a discount supermarket. It's not part of a chain. It's a standalone independent. And it seems to, like NQR, it gets end of runs, overruns, change of packaging, close to use, buy or best before, that sort of thing. They do have excellent um, dairy and frozen mostly um, specials if you're looking for dairy or cheeses, butter, that sort of thing, excellent prices on those. Um, they have a Facebook page so you can join their Facebook page and get the notifications. Yeah. It's um, Save More is on Dandenong Road, Princess Highway, um, Springvale. Opposite, where did they have the train exhibition? Cool. Sandown. Yeah. Um, Judy, yes, I do spray the fruit trees. I make up the um, homemade white oil in a spray bottle. Well, hmm, okay. I'm not an actual by the book gardener, in case you didn't know. So I spray them when I think of it. Oops. But I feed my fruit trees every week with either worm tea or compost tea or sea sol every week. Now, I know that goes against everything that the books and the experts say too, but an older lady who is now about 97 or 98 and had around 60 different varieties of fruit trees, citrus and stone fruits and all sorts of things in her yard told me to do that. And so I do. And it saved them actually because the council was spraying for blackberries and on a windy day. Who sprays for blackberries on a windy day? And it blew over onto my trees, all my trees and my veggie gardens along that area of fence, all within a matter of hours shriveled up and feed, pruning them back and then feeding them um, with the worm tea and the compost tea saved my fruit trees. Okay. Um, Yep, I just use um, the white oil, which is a little bit of water, a little bit of dishwasher, a little bit of veggie oil, shake it up in a, in a bottle and spray it on. And that's what I spray them with. Um, <laughs> a bit out of your five kilometres, <laughs> might be. Um, yeah. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining us. If you haven't already, please give us a thumbs up. It really, really does help our rankings with YouTube, which means nothing to me, but it just makes it easier for you to find us if you're searching for us or for a video. And the other thing I would really appreciate, if you could save, um, save us, share, share our videos with anyone that you think might be interested or could use whatever I'm blathering on about at the time, use the help, I would really appreciate that too. The more people that know about us, the um, why do we spread the word that you can live life debt-free, cashed up and laughing. Okay, I'm going to go because Hannah's really had it with me now. Have a great week, everyone. I'll see you next Tuesday. Now, if I've missed a question, pop it in the comments down here and I'll do my best to answer it um, tomorrow for you. Thank you again so much for joining us and have a great week. Bye.